My great pleasure to introduce you to, uh, to uh, the Masakane group today. My name is Dr. Isabel Zog. I am a postdoctoral research scientist at the Data Science Institute at Columbia. And uh, I was invited to create a talk and moderate and host a talk with um, an individual or a group of my choice. And I am really excited about the work that Masakane is doing and wanted to share that work with our wider Columbia and global community. Um, and so it's my great pleasure today to be joined by a number of the members of Masakane. I wanna give a brief introduction uh, before we go into uh, a, a group presentation and kind of series of lightning talks followed by a group discussion. So Masakane is a grassroots organization whose mission is to strengthen and spur NLP research in African languages for Africans by Africans. Despite the fact that 2000 of the world's languages are African, African languages are barely represented in technology. The tragic past of colonialism has been devastating for African languages in, term, in terms of their support, preservation and integration. This has resulted in technological space that does not understand our names, our cultures, our places, and our history. And I'm taking this from uh, the Masakane mission statement. Masakane roughly translates to we build together in Isu Isuzulu. Our goal is for Africans to shape and own these technological advances towards human dignity, well being, and equity through inclusive community building, open participatory research, and multidisciplinarity. And I really encourage everyone to take a look at their website. Um, they have a really thorough and um, really, I think, elegant and important um, statement on their values, uh, the current state of NLP in Africa, and the methods by which they are uh, working to basically build a very different future for uh, African languages uh, within technological support. And they are also um, very collaborative and they are open to collaboration with people that share you know, their vision and values. And so um, I will drop in a link to their website here in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I want to uh, introduce our speakers today. Oh, thank you for doing that. Um, so our speakers today, uh, including, I'm thinking there may be some that are part of the slides and some that are here in person. Um, we have Jal Hacheme, we have Bonaventure Dosau, Perez Ogayo, Jade Abbott, Mohammed Ahmed, and Colin Long, Leong. Um, and uh, also here represented on the slides uh, are Chris Emezue, uh, let's see, Tadese Destau. Uh, he's actually here with us today. And yes, and the many other um, members of Masakane. I know recently they hit a thousand members. So, you know, this is quite a large and, um, you know, very multifaceted group. And so we're very pleased to have you uh, here with us today, virtually, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess. So we can, since we're spread across so many locations, um, to have you join with us here today at Columbia's Data Science Institute. So I'll pass it over to you now. Hello, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, we're certainly joining you from uh, across multiple time zones. Um, thank you to um, Isabel for inviting us and Alexis for organizing this. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to the um, Distinguished Speaker Series at uh, Columbia University. Um, we're Masakane, and uh, has already done a great amount of the introduction for us. Um, effectively, what we stand for is NLP for African languages by Africans and for Africans. And we've already done this. You know who we are and where Masakane comes from. Masakane is a group of grassroots organization whose mission is to strengthen African NLP, uh, to enrich it, to grow it, to nurture it, and to further it, in the hope of making African languages a atomic and principal component of NLP as it's studied. And there's a reason for this. Um, the primary reason is that 30% of all living languages today are African languages. Now, if you were to go and look for that, 
or representation in what is out there in terms of published literature material on the web you're going to not you're not going to find it it's woefully you know, missing and inadequate um, i often find this um, snippet quite useful um, the top five african languages spoken um, together account for less than um, 700,000 articles on Wikipedia. That's a tiny number. Uh, these are languages that are spoken by literally hundreds of millions of people. That lack of representation effectively translates into a practical disenchantment and disenfranchising of the African populace in the world in terms of how technology today progresses and the way that language is represented for us. And what we hope to do is to change that. Now, this process of changing it started, or at least the Masakani incarnation started with a call of action, a call to action um, for machine translation in African languages at the Deep in Darbo in Nairobi in 2019. And I hope that you can hear me when I play this for you. Um, but in any case, we'll put on the subtitles. Now, what Jade was effectively saying is that, and I hope you heard that, is if we get together, we can actually put our resources together and put our brains together and our knowledge in order to make that change instead of waiting for that change to come to us. Yeah. And that work, and that rather call, led to this participatory approach for low resource language translation. And the first work that really came out of Masakana was this work on participatory research. And what we'll do here is we're going to give you a flavor of that participatory research by giving you an outline of what we've done and a bunch of lightning talks highlighting different works that the group members have done, which shows how people's interest and passion for their languages can impact on enriching and, uh, and strengthening African NLP. You can hand over if you like. Go for it. So this was sort of our, our seminal paper, um, uh, participatory research for low resource machine translation, a, a case study for African language. Um, and this is my signal to Mohammed to change the slide. <laughs> and kind of the, the thing we're dealing with, so in the NLP space, um, you know, if we're looking at English, uh, there's there's a there's a lot of data, and what people typically say about the African languages, they say, oh, but it doesn't have data. It's the only reason it's not not working. Um, but the problem is that low resourceness is about more than just data. It's a societal issue. There's a deeper reason why that data doesn't exist, and we need to address that if we're going to sort out this data issue. Um, and so, when we first started doing this research, uh, we kind of saw this kind of societal lack of focus. Um, which was very much driven by uh, colonialism. Um, and so there was no demand for African languages uh, in the digital space. Um, and this resulted in very few discoverable resources and a lack of a creation of public data sets. Um, and like a, a, this resulted in a reproduction crisis where no one could build on anyone's work. And as a result, this kind of impeded uh, novel, novel research and innovation and progress. And so, this picture typically um, is super well um, connected, um, but it kind of represents what you need for any sort of NLP to take place. So you have some sort of person who creates content. Um, this could be authors, this could be uh, poets, this could be um, lyricists, um, and they have to exist producing content, in our case, producing content in, in kind of the digital realm. Um, and then you either need an annotation or translator. Um, so uh, translation in, in, in the case of if, you, if we're going to end up with some machine translation technology or annotation um, for, for other uh, uh, NLP tasks. Uh, then there's someone who creates, curates a data set, a curator. 
Um, a curated data set is then taken by a language technologist, um, and then someone needs to, to then evaluate what the output of this language technologist is. And for kind of English to French, um, I'm back still. <laughs> for English to French, you'd see that this is very well connected. Everyone has the requirements they need in order to produce the necessary artifacts. Um, but in the African context, each of these connections is highly constrained. Um, so we're missing uh, basic things from like the keyboards which we use. So there's not a, it's not unsurprising that we don't have a lot of data in um, font, for example, because you know only recently was a font digital keyboard created. Um, and so at each of these steps in kind of the African context, we are missing all these prerequisites, and we're also missing sort of the bridges between uh, the agents. Stop there. <laughs> Click, I double clicked twice on, on Mohammed. Um, <laughs> so um, our kind of methodology in order to address this was to try lower the barrier to entry into getting your first hands-on NLP experience in an African language. Um, and so what we did is we made it super easy for any um, African to come train a, a translation model um, on an African language of their choice. Um, we utilized what existing data sets they were, no matter how small they were. Uh, and then we ensured that uh, we, our results were shared online um, uh, and uh, that everything was open source. Um, and kind of the goal there was to kind of build this, this open community that didn't have academic prerequisites. Um, so we had people working on their undergrads, people from completely different fields, all joining this, this community in order to, to work on um, machine translation. And so this is kind of the goal is we want to create these, facilitate these, these um, uh, relationships um, by working on a lot of the prerequisite technologies, um, but also enabling these connections. Um, so right now, uh, well, before Masakane, if you wanted to work on an African, if you wanted to use uh, an African uh, technology, such as like maybe a Google Translate for Europa, um, the people building those tools weren't actually, you know, the same people who could speak the language. And this is what resulted in many of the problems. So by building Masakane, we're essentially bringing everyone um, into who needs to be into the room, into the room. And so our outcome was as follows. Uh, we have 47 translation models for 35 African languages that were published. I think this number has gone up to, to much more. Um, and from this, we did uh, an early evaluation of these models, so a human-driven evaluation, because even the metrics that we use in, in many of the NLP spaces aren't appropriate for, for many other languages. Um, so we did some human-grounded evaluation, um, and uh, that human-grounded evaluation, uh, we brought in uh, tools from different domains. So we trained on uh, the Jehovah's Witness corpus, because that is very widely translated. Um, and then we went and did human post-editing studies on uh, COVID-19 surveys, since this was something that people actually asked us to do, and we wanted to show them how this was just not going to be possible. Um, and then some, some TED Talks, which also uh, are quite widely translated. Um, and so if we kind of see, this is where we all started, and we, we look back over the, the past two years, the African NLP space has quite significantly changed, um, and this is uh, sort of wonderful. Um, and so Masakanya right now has over a thousand participants. We've got 35 African countries involved. I should actually do a more recent count, over 40 African languages, you know, over 40 GitHub contributors, over 40 publications that we've kind of published at you know, two conference workshops and beyond. And we're organizing or attempting to organize our third one for, for next year, African NLP workshop. Um, we've got a deep dive. Oh, that's fine. Got at least five data sets. We've got over 10 ongoing initiatives. These are ongoing projects at any point in time. We've got a number of part-time positions as part of the organization. We've won multiple awards. We've got a number of job connections that have occurred through the network, uh, as well as kind of academic achievements of people choosing to pursue a, a PhD um, because of their involvement or able to choose it because they've now got some publications. Um, and one of our big awards was uh, we got the Wikimedia Foundation um, uh, a research award of the year for for our participatory paper um, and this is such a this is so great for us um, because we actually fought to get this published we had a lot of pushback because we were basically taking a very empirical um, NLP conference and we tried to publish something that said actually empiricism isn't going to solve this or at least you know running large models over and over again isn't going to solve this issue we have to take this other approach and so we actually quite fought to get it published so it was great to have it later on acknowledged by um, uh, Wikimedia 
Um, and it was really cool to have Jimmy Wales present um, the, the award to the group. And from this, we're getting like tangible things. Um, we, our goal is to eventually build real tools that can be used. And in the interim, uh, we have created, uh, we've deployed our models. They're, they're not here for production use. They're very much research-based, basically to expose the issues uh, that we still have. Um, so for instance, we've got these issues where, because we've trained on religious domain, we translate into, um, uh, you know, what, what we, like our translations often become, um, uh, what's the word, biblicized, because that is uh, the only data that they have. And so through this, we're able to learn, we're able to improve the translations, and we're able to gather more data to train better models um, through these two web initiatives. Um, we have many initiatives going on at all, all points in time, and so today we're going to talk to you about a couple of the ones. Um, so I've just spoken to you about the participatory paper, um, but we're also going to hear about uh, Masaka Nur, so named entity recognition, know our names. Um, Perez will be speaking on that. Um, we're going to hear about question answering um, from Giles. Um, we're going to hear about uh, multilingual MT, FFR translate, and oh, I'm never going to get this pronunciation right, Bona. <laughs> um, by, by Bonaventure. Um, and uh, as well as a, the data audit um, paper, which is a, a completed one, um, uh, Colin will be talking a little bit about that. <laughs> um, cool. I will hand over to, to Bonaventure. Okay. Uh... Mohamed, can you please allow me to assess your screen? Oh, oops. Okay. So, um, yeah, so thank you, Jade, for what you've talked about so far. Um, this uh, FFI is one of the projects that we, Chris and I, who unfortunately is not here, we've uh, tried to lead. And the project was kind of unique in his job because it was the first one, uh, the first search of work to be done in uh, for font French machine translation. So um, we created like the largest parallel corpus of our data set for font and French. Um, we did two versions of the paper, F5 1.0 and 1.1, and then showcasing the uh, importance of having, uh, of keeping, of handling, being able to handle those diacritics because they help the model to uh, avoid ambiguity. And also we showed technically that um, a lot of data matters, but also qualitative data also matters. And of course, um, the result that we achieved were uh, benchmark and the so-called state of the art. Um, for phone and phone French back to back translation task. And we open source the website so that and a lot of people could assess it and uh, go and give the feedback. So uh, on your right, what you're seeing is technically the video of how the website looks like. That's just on the uh, mobile view, it's much more standard on a web view. And people can enter the sentence in phone. Uh, have the translation in French and vice versa. That there was the uh, the keyboard um, Jade mentioned earlier that we invented. Uh, no, we co-created because people couldn't use these rights in front if they don't have the right keyboard with the right symbols, right? Um, I think I'm going to fast forward it, but before moving to Okube, I just also wanted to say that to make the things much more better, we made available a system of kind of um, feedback. So the users were are able to provide feedback. So if they translate a sentence for us and that's not what they were expecting, they could suggest a translation and give a kind of score of our level of correctness for us that translation that provide. So that's a way for us like, to get uh, feedback and to get more data, more qualitative data. Uh, the second aspect here is Okube and Okube is the concatenation of two words, Oku, which means speech and Be, which means uh, languages. 
respectively in, for, in Igbo and, and Fon. So um, there you can see the QR code to our paper. And uh, in the paper, we, yeah, that was it. In the paper, we tried to give a very detailed linguistic analysis of both languages. We are not linguists, uh, but we felt it was quite important. So we try to show, for instance, the similarity and the differences, the semblances of the of both languages. For instance, uh, Fon being an isolating language and Ibo being an agglutinating one, that's already two different um, linguistic properties. Um, also, uh, Ibo use a lot of code switching, and this is practically uh, not existing in form. Of course, now it exists because there are people like me who are uh, hybrid. They are like, oh, when they cannot complete the sentence in form, they just jump in with French. Uh, but originally it was not in, and yes. And there's, there's also like many tonal aspects that also we've covered and everything. So uh, the work that we did at Kube falls in the field in the category of very extreme low resource languages. <laughs> low resource, extremely low resource languages where we have very few amounts of data. So for instance, for phone, we just use like 10 hours, which is relatively small because I think the norm was somewhere around 10,000 hours of recordings to to have a very a pretty decent uh, system. Um, and for Igbo, we had very less, way less data. And finally, the data had a lot of problems that we had to clean. And it, it was not even not open source yet. So that's also something that Chris and I are working, to, are working on. So um, with Okube, we provided a state of the art model for fun because there was one who was existing before done by one professor of mine. So we've been able to uh, beat that result. And for Igbo, it was, uh, it's a, a benchmark, a benchmark because um, I, we don't know if they are existing models for Igbo. If they are not, then that's a benchmark and state of the art, but yeah, that's it. So um, we tried, Oh no, that's a little bit too fast. So maybe you can come back. We try a lot of different architectures and uh, the, we also try to play around and then to adapt the attention mechanism to our problem. And that's what gave the best results uh, down there. So the best result uh, of font function was 42 and that's way better than 44. WER means what error rate and CR means character error rate. So the lower, the better. Um, yeah, so now the last one that I'll be talking about is MMT Africa, uh, which is a multilingual machine translation for African languages. Uh, is basically a kind of, um, um, I don't know how to put it, but usually what we do is like we train one system from language A to language B and then one from language B to language A. So that's already two more models or things like that. And all of those require um, uh, resources, computational resources. So uh, we try to put together a, uh, to make use of uh, pre-trained models and advances in the field to create a model, a unique model that could translate between cis African languages and two Western African lang Western languages uh, from one to another. So I can translate from Igbo to Kinyarwanda, then from Kinyarwanda to Kosa, from Kosa to Fon, from Fon to Swahili, from Swahili to Yoruba, and from Yoruba to French, from French to English, and so on, and do like any combination as, as, I, as I want, just with that same model. So, um, the novelty in MMT Africa is uh, a new like kind of way of doing reconstruction that was inspired from the modeling of the T5, which is the Petron model of Google we used. And we showed that um, technically on those models existing already on the Petron model, the reconstruction was better. And for those one who didn't exist, then doing back translation alone works better. And why? 
we'd provided much more uh, detailed explanations and how we could confirm that kind of those hypotheses better uh, in our paper. And uh, we've also compared it to Flores model from Facebook AI, Flores 101, who's been trained on uh, 101 languages, including a lot of African languages. So like you can see in the majority of the cases, we've outperformed by far the the, 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 the Flores model and everything. And we've also provided, uh, we've also created a data set uh, we, we had data set, so we created a training set and a test set. So on our test 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 set, we've also provided results which can be or could, could be uh, used as benchmark for future works. And yeah, I think that's it. Technically everything, and we are, this work is going to be presented soon at um, WMT at Yemenopi 2021. Yeah, so that's technically what I've already said. And yeah, I will. Lead, leave the floor to Perez to talk about NER and everything. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Bonaventure. Um, I'm going to talk about Masakanga, which is um, a project that we did for um, de developing data sets for name identity recognition for African languages. Um, so we have a data set that exists for name entity recognition, but then um, as like for as it is the case with like many African languages, we don't have them um, represented in the existing data sets. So um, we decided to create one and uh, this one is annotated by native speakers uh, who volunteered through Masakane. And we had like a minimum of two annotators per sentence there were languages that had more annotators than others um depending on their availability and overall we found um a high interagreement score of about 0 0.96 um which was really good and uh i found like the quality of the data set that we created um so in total we had 10 languages re represented uh three regions and uh, four language families um, and the languages that you see here were mostly what uh, the factors that led to these languages that you see here being here is um, the availability of annotators and uh, another thing was the availability of online news covers because that's what we used um, we were focusing on news data sets um, it's because it's better to get like named entity for getting named entity recognition and that greatly influenced the um, the number of languages and which languages you could work on for this one and so we had three models that we were using we had like a cnn bio stm model and embat and exalum Roberta. um so overall we found that the pre-trained language model uh, pre-trained language models were better when we use them than CNN. And probably that's mostly because of the ability for cross-lingual transfer. And um, next slide, please. And previous slides. So something also that we noted is um, with the uh, pre-trained language models is, uh, for example, when you introduce a language that wasn't there before, like Amharic is not in um, MBAT and that kind of like affected it. And if you exclude Amharic from uh, the like list and uh, find the average of the scores, you find that there's no difference between MBAT and XLMR. And so we had to like do some modification to like introducing uh, Amharic vocab vocabulary for it in MBAT uh, to make it work, and which may be cause for including more African languages uh, in pre-trained uh, mm -hmm. models. And next slide, please. So we also did a fine grain analysis on those models to find where they were struggling. And on average, um, when you we look at all the languages, we found that the models struggled on zero frequencies 
a zero frequency entity. So these are like the entities that are not in the training data and long entities. And uh, we hope that uh, future work can try and study why uh, this usually happens. And another thing that we did was uh, we tried other approaches to try and improve models, to try and improve the um, quality of the output of the models. And uh, we found that including uh, gazetteers, for example, and uh, cross-lingual transfer helped. And um, for languages like Luo and uh, Nigerian Pidgin, which didn't have like uh, gazetteers, we had to use like gazetteers from English and it did help a bit. And Thank you, Colleen. So gazetteers are simply a big list of named entities. Um, so uh, we are expanding this work and we hope to, to include up to 20 languages mostly. And we hope that more work can be done on new identity for African languages. I'll invite Jules to continue. Thank you, Paris. Uh, so uh, this is a project we conducting with in partnership with Google. Uh, the goal is to build uh, a cross-lingual open retrieval question answering system uh, that accounts for uh, 10 African languages. Uh, so uh, what is uh, a question, uh, question answer uh, system? It is simply, at least uh, in its current definition, uh, a system that finds or uh, span in a passage as an answer to an answerable question. So a traditional approach uh, is that you have a question in English and you uh, looking for an answer in English and just uh, state of the art, there are state of the art approaches for that like SpanBird, ExcelNet, uh, et cetera. Uh, so this traditional approach is limited because sometimes uh, especially when you're dealing with low resource languages, uh, you have some questions that maybe uh, don't have any answer uh, on the internet uh, because there are not so much resources in, in, in those languages. But you can find, uh, sometimes you can find the answer in another language. And so um, what one another approach is using a, a multilingual, uh, having a multilingual approach. Uh, that, that is you have, a question in a given language, but you can find the answer in another language. Uh, this approach helps uh, at least uh, solving, or uh, at least temporarily uh, solving the, the scarcity, the information scarcity uh, 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 of low resource languages. Uh, you can have a question in Yoruba and uh, uh, find the answer in French or in English, uh, et cetera. There's also a problem of cultural bias. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so uh, you, you, you can be a Beninese like me and you want maybe to have some information about uh, 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 Ron Paul. Ron Paul is simply um, a member of the US House of Representatives from Texas. And the problem is that uh, there is pretty no resource in form, my, my native language. Uh, and uh, 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 still there are answer to this question in the, in the English Wikipedia. Here, the example you have on this slide is, is an example from uh, Esai and, and co-authors uh, that is typically taking a question in Japanese and uh, uh, trying to translate it in English because the answer is not in the Japanese uh, Wikipedia. So when the answer is, the question is translated in, uh, in English, you can look at the Wikipedia, uh, the English Wikipedia, and you can find that, uh, the, uh, that Ron Paul major uh, uh, is biology. And this answer, you can't find it uh, in, the, in the Japanese Wikipedia. And this is typically what is called the cultural bias, uh, that you asking a question uh, in which maybe uh, 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 your, your people from uh, speaking the same language that, like you uh, maybe uh, don't, do not necessarily have the same interest in the, uh, in the type of answer you, you're looking for. And so you can just look at uh, the, 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 the language uh, uh, I would say here it is English because uh, uh, Ron Paul is a, an American rep representative and 
there are more chances that you get the answer from the English Wikipedia than getting the answer from the Japanese or from the Yoruba or from the the the, the phone uh, Wikipedia. So, uh, <laughs> just a remark: phone doesn't even have any Wikipedia, and this is a fact. Uh, so we need to build multilingual uh, QA data sets, and uh, um, there are some 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 already existing. Uh, uh, multilingual data sets, but they are often English centric. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the way they are, of, are very often uh, built is that uh, just some, some data sets are just, are just, are just uh, are considered from English and translated back to uh, other languages. But the problem with that is that we having questions uh, that are not really, uh, that are kind of multilingual but not multicultural, okay? Because uh, having questions about uh, American soccer is not necessarily relevant for somebody from Benin like me, or I'm not necessarily looking for uh, this type of, uh, I, I don't have any questions necessarily uh, uh, to, about this kind of, kind of subjects. So I, I really, I can kind of have some questions about uh, 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 some African presidents, uh, some African rivals, some 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 they, 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 some, some questions about uh, my own culture, uh, the way people uh, maybe uh, the way people preserve, uh, 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 I would say preserve, uh, I would say um, yeah, typically talking about our, our own culture, uh, the way we eat, the way, the way we, we dance, the way we, we, we speak. And uh, there are lots of the way we, we do sport. It is not necessarily the same way uh, the, the, the American people uh, are doing that. And uh, this is typically something we have to account for when we want to generate questions for uh, those data sets. And uh, uh, there is uh, one data set that, that is the first one to the best of our knowledge, of course, uh, uh, trying to uh, take take this multi multicultural uh, point of view into account. It, uh, that is the Zorro uh, Tidy QA. Uh, currently, these data sets include Arabic, Bengali, Finnish, uh, Japanese, Korean, Russian, and, and Telugu. Uh, and now, next, now we're trying to we're trying to account for uh, ten African languages. Uh, Yoruba, Hausa, Zulu, Igbo, etc. And uh, the, 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 the goal is to be able to write a question in a given African language. And uh, maybe uh, this question, if it is not, if uh, the, the system cannot find any answer in the, in the, in the original language, uh, this question can be translated uh, in a high resource language and uh, uh, the system will try to find the answer and translate back the answer into the original language. Uh, so currently, currently we are collecting, we have collected data from Wikipedia. Uh, so not every language is, uh, we, are, we are working on the, uh, have uh, Wikipedia like phone, for instance. So we are using um, some, some pivot language because phone is the official language of Benin. Uh, is, is not, not, not the official language, the main dialect of Benin, but French is the official language. So what we're trying to do is using uh, 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 the Wikipedia articles uh, uh, talking about Benin and its culture that, that, that are written in French. And uh, we use those, uh, uh, those articles in order to, uh, to, to generate questions. So this is the step two. The step two is using the data set that we have collected in order to, to generate the questions that will be used uh, uh, in our system. Uh, so the, the, the final step will be, yeah, training uh, those cross-lingual QA systems. And uh, all, all those steps are conducted very in a, in a very par, uh, in a participatory approach, and uh, everybody is uh, welcome. If you have any, um, if you want to contribute in any way to the, to this project, we are open, and uh, uh, we do like uh, working with with others, and so we are very happy to to present you this project, and we hope that we can collaborate together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Tadasa, and 
I'm a lecturer from one of uh, the recognized Ethiopian University. And I became a member, of, I'm proud to be a member of Masaka uh, through the invitation of my supervisor. Uh, by the way, are you, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you, Mami. Uh, and uh, uh, through the, I joined this Masakan community through the invitation of, uh, invitations of my uh, supervisor, that is uh, uh, Said Muhe. And uh, I know. Um, okay, uh, this paper will be published uh, in your desk in uh, IEEE. Uh, impacts of homophone normalization on semantic models for Amharic. And uh, next. Yeah, as you know all, that's Amharic is a semantic language and this is the second most spoken uh, semantic language after Arabic and it's uh, an official language of Ethiopia. For writing, for writing, Amharic uses Giz alphabet that is called uh, Fidel. Uh, it has a total of around 34 basic characters with ways uh, seven derivations of each character, each basic character. And there are a lot of characters in Amharic uh, that have the same sound, which are called homophone characters. Uh, for example, those are homophone characters uh, that have the same sound. For example, the first line that uh, in Amharic, there are four ha sound uh, characters along with uh, their seven derivatives, two a sound, two sa sound, and uh, two sa sound. Those are Amharic homophone characters currently having uh, the same sound. And the, when we see the current trend in American LP researches, normalize those homophone characters into a single representation. Uh, into a single representation. That means, for example, instead of those, uh, the first line of the example, instead of uh, those six or seven types of ha sound, use one single ha sound. Instead of four those four types of a sound, uh, normalize into uh, one a sound, and so on. This because of uh, there are different assumptions. Uh, on one side, there are there is an assumption that normalize will make the NLP task easier. Homophones interchangeably use the trend, especially in the online community, and and there are also an assumption that they are redundant, redundant alpha meters. On the second hand, there are also another assumption that is. Uh, the standard, the Amharic standardization will uh, have included those homophone characters in the writing system. So, uh, in case of this, we have studied the impacts of homophone normalization on semantic models. Uh, next, for this research purpose, we have uh, collected around 6.8 million uh, free corpus sentences from different available social medias, like from news. Uh, from Twitter, and we have built uh, different semantic models or pre trained embedding models. Uh, we have built those uh, World TV, FastX, Roberta, and Flare embedding models we using those uh, uh, parameters. And finally, we have fine tuned those pre trained embedding models into different American NLP applications like named entity recognition, sentiment analysis, part of speech tagging. For the labeled data, we have we adopted the previously conducted uh, labeled data for named entity recognition, part of speech tagging sentiment analysis. We have adopted the previously conducted uh, labeled data, and we have fine tuned our pre-trained embedding models to those specific and uh, American NLP applications. And we find our finding showed that normalization is highly dependent on the downstream NLP applications. For example, for sentiment analysis and for parts of speech tagging, normalization has a big negative impact. And well, for information retrieval, uh, normalization has a positive impact. And as a conclusion, we have contributed the first large Amharic free corpus and publications of those pre trained embedding models are our main contribution of this work. These are some of uh, this work. Thank you. Colin, you're up. And I believe this is my cue. Hello, everyone. I'm Colin Leong. Uh, Colin me by my name is correct um, because that's my name. Uh, so yeah, I uh, am not an African. Uh, 
or I wasn't, but uh, I wanted to talk today a about sort of a case study of what it's like to join Masakane and get involved, right? And then sort of, sort of close with a little call to action to people on this call. So a little case study. Um, we had a call on the Masakane Slack, uh, yes, um, where a, one of our researchers said, hey, we're going to be auditing a bunch of web crawled multilingual data sets. And so next slide, please. Uh, so one thing to know is that in recent years, there's been a lot of uh, research groups using web crawling to automatically try and find and tag you know, various languages and create uh, data sets for them. Uh, because it's a lot of work to create data. So what if we just um, create them with computers? And then um, I think the idea is that like, you know, it, it, you you just get enough and then it'll be good. Um, well, we decided to basically just glance through these. And what we found is that literally like at a glance, even if you don't even speak the language, you can uh, learn some things about the quality. Um, so we called out for lots and lots of volunteers and um, found some rather worrying statistics about the data. So for example, 15 plus of the corpora would just complete total garbage, as in that language wasn't even the language. Um, and you know, a lot of other issues with like less than 50% of the sentence were usable at all. Um, next slide, please. So here's a particular example of the annotations we were doing. This is supposedly on the right column, Arabic. And if you can't read the, the text, let me just describe to you some of what's going on here. Um, Zips brew house. Uh, now I don't speak Arabic, but I think that Zips brew house or Edward Wong, May 12, 2019 or E325D, E329D. I don't think that those are Arabic. I, I'm pretty confident that that's not Arabic. And so I was able to annotate this entire sample of quote, Romanized Arabic, unquote, myself with no language experience at all in Arabic. And this was just like a really, interesting way that people of the community could get involved. But also, next slide, it turns out that I actually have uh, non-NLP people who are my friends and family. So what I did was I got my dad involved and he speaks seven languages, including Malay, uh, Tamil, Mandarin Chinese, Taiwanese Chinese, uh, various other types of Chinese. And so I got him to help me annotate some of these data sets. So in this case, we have Mandarin Chinese on the right and English on the left. And like some of this, I was able to annotate pretty correctly. Like on the left, you have the words embedded subtitles but on the right, you literally have the words simplified Chinese, but written in simplified Chinese. So presumably these were like next to each other on a web page somewhere and it erroneously thought that they meant the same thing. Um, but no, that's the name of the language, not the words embedded subtitles. Or for example, like we have this thing about the Marriott Hotel in the left, and then we start to get into more complex grammar and stuff on the right, so I did need his help with that. And he told me, oh, well, it basically gets suggested across that this is where the Marriott Hotel is and et cetera. 
or like, oh, is that the correct wording for stainless steel water filter, right? Gigabit internet, that sort of thing. And um, I think that's all the slides we've got. But yeah, I first wanted to conclude personally that, you know, even though it says, you know, African NLP by Africans for Africans, it's been an incredible experience to be involved. And then one day they even said, no, you, you, you are an honorary African, Colin, right? And of all of the honors I've received, you know, my vast list of honors, right? Um, that's one of the ones I treasure the most. Um, it was through Masakane, for example, that I trained my first machine translation model ever, which uh, I have now successfully created the world's greatest model for an obscure language called Hani in Southern China. It is also, I think, the world's only machine translation model for Hani, but I couldn't have done it without the help of Masakane and the encouragement there. But you don't have to be an NLP person. You can just get involved. You can make some Wikipedia articles. You talk about all of the stuff that Jade had at the beginning with the different connections, right? I think we need people of all walks of life. So if you want, come join us at Masakana. That's all I have to say. So thank you. Um, I hope what you saw is a flavor of the range and the depth of Masakane and the ingenuity and um, passion that people have to advance African languages in many different formats and different directions. Now, Masakane is growing. We're just over a thousand people at the moment and we're expanding. We're in the process of founding, founding the Masakane organization in Africa, uh, in Kenya. So now we'll have an actual real organization. We're in the process of defining a larger roadmap for African NLP and collaborating with a whole host of different um, interested parties that might be able to benefit from this. Um, the differently able is, for example, a good community that's massively underrepresented that we're interested in. Um, um, what do you call it? building bridges with. Um, we're in the process of collaborating with the African Union in order to understand how we can better advance the African languages. We're uh, engaging with linguists. In fact, we've just hired our first linguist, official linguist, linguistic residents. Uh, uh, linguists in residence at Masakane who will be looking at how linguistics can be used in order to support African languages and development of machine learning and technology for African languages. We're expanding outside of the English uh, environment and we're expanding into the Lucifer and Francophone world um, because there's a lot of material there and a lot of people that use those languages that are massively underserved already, so we don't want to be pigeonholed in the anglophone world. Um, and Ms. Kane is charting a ethical NLP uh, um, document to understand what our perspectives, our positions and our points of view are. Um, all of this is being done in a participatory manner where people are free to exchange their ideas and bring their thoughts into mind uh, to paper and um, we hope that uh, you, you'll find you found this interesting and that yeah you find some way of uh, contributing thank you um, and we'll end it there for the moment wonderful thank you for the fantastic talks very um, different angles and uh, really, really interesting the work that's being done. And I really appreciate, you know, I appreciate all the talks. Thank you, Colin, for talking a little bit about collaboration. That was actually going to be one of my questions um, because I know, uh, I know the community to be very collaborative. And I thought some of our guests here today may kind of have that question, like may be interested to get involved. Um, so yeah, I'd welcome any further kind of comments on that from anyone, but I also want to give our guests a chance um, if there are any questions. Uh, I see one already appearing in the chat. What is the best way to connect about a partnership? 
uh, DDD is looking to build language data sets in Kenya and elsewhere in Africa. Um, and another comment about the beautiful artwork and uh, thanks for the attribution. Okay, and uh, I think we have a clarification. DDD is digital divide data. And good. So should I should I open that up? Would someone like to speak to that? The best way to connect for a partnership? Yep. Um, so kind of one of the things to kind of be aware of is uh, if you if you want to partner um, or if you're looking to partner with Masakane is that it has to be of interest to um, the community. Um, and you'll learn very quickly if your uh, idea is not of interest because you're not going to get any traction when you when you present it to people or when you present it. Um, and so I think a second thing I think to to kind of iteration it yeah before anyone uh, thinks about going forward is that like Masakan is not an annotation community. Um, we're not people who annotate. We're not translators. We do do it when we're evaluating models. We do do it in in a small scale. Um, but when we want to scale it out, we we actually you know get funding and we often work with professionals. Um, and so uh, the yeah we're not solely data collectors we're model builders we're end to end um, uh, at uh, collaborators uh, and guides in this task um, so uh, just want to get that out the way because <laughs> um, occasionally we end up with the uh, awkward situations where people come and they're like oh we thought we'd come here and get data and we could pay you money and you'd give us data that's not what, really what we do but if you are looking to collaborate there are there are two points uh, of collaboration. Um, number one is join the Slack. Every Thursday we have a call um, and uh, anyone can then present uh, their idea um, and ask volunteers. They can also post on the Slack for, for collaborators. Um, and that's for um, kind of a more informal partnership. If you want to do a more formalized partnership, you know, maybe put an MOU in place and we need to figure that out. I'd suggest um, mes uh, messaging uh, the Masakane Leadership um, Google group um, and that's for if, if there's a stuff that needs to be signed and discussed. We'll probably advise you um, to first do uh, <laughs> come to a, a meeting and present it to everyone. Um, so yeah, so there's the informal one, which is just join and participate, and you'll find people to work with, and you'll want to work on projects, and you'll you know if, if it's exciting to the community, you'll get a lot of traction. Um, and then if you want to take that further, where we can involve people. Um, in kind of a, a more info, a, like formalized capacity. Do we want to set up internships together? Do we want to like do something really concrete? Internships are really, really good for, um, you know, master students or PhD students who may be looking at going abroad. Um, so those are, are really good ways to kind of uh, in, involve yourself, particularly coming from a, 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 a you know, an, an academic background. Um, so yes, that's my answer to that. I don't know if anyone else has any uh, other things to augment that with. That was good. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we're we're coming up on the top of the hour. And you know, I have I have some other questions I've noted down, but I also want to be respectful of people's time. So I, I think maybe this might be kind of a natural ending point and I can always follow up with with Masakane, you know, later on other points of discussion. Um, so uh, we're getting a number of, you know, thank yous and, uh, you know, compliments and things in the chat. So thank you to all of our guests for joining uh, and to our wonderful speakers. And I hope this meeting is kind of a seed that can grow and maybe some of us will meet again in different ways, maybe collaborations or, you know, looking into the, the work that you're publishing and the, you know, the tools that you're building and, this can, you know, be part of something that um, part of your kind of continued growth as an organization working in all of these important languages. So um, thank you, Jade. You just put the, um, I think, an email into the chat for people who like to be in touch. Um, so I think that wraps us up, unless there's anything else that anyone would like to say. Thanks again from for joining us. Thanks so much for having us, Isabel. Thank you very much for having us, Isabel. Yeah, my pleasure, really, my honor and, and pleasure. And the rest of the Columbia crew as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, we're so we're so pleased to have you. So hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.